What's up Lazy Dog fam? Hope everybody out there is having a fantastic day. Today we're going to continue our discussion of seed starting basics that we started in that last video. So in the last video I told you my three top reasons for why you should grow your own transplants as opposed to going to the store and buying them. And then we got into some of the basics of seed starting, specifically talking about containers, what type of trays or containers you should use to grow your own transplants, and also soil, the type of seed starting mix specifically you should use for growing your own transplants. And if you didn't catch that video, you probably want to watch that one before you watch this one. So I'll put a card up here somewhere so you can catch that video, kind of get caught up. And today we're going to be adding to that discussion, talking about heat, talking about lighting, probably talking about fertilization of seedlings. And maybe we'll have time to get our first tray of seeds started for the 2022 seed starting season. So let's go in the greenhouse. And let's talk more about seed starting. So first let's talk about heat and heat mats or germination mats and do you need one of those if you're going to start growing your own transplants. Now obviously we're in a greenhouse here and I know some of you have a greenhouse. Some of you are growing seeds indoors inside your house or maybe inside your garage. So I'll try to cover all the bases here about heat and what you need to get those seeds germinated. So do you need a heat mat? Well, not always. It's probably a pretty good idea to keep one on hand. We use heat mats a lot this time of year when we're starting warm season crops, crops that need warmer soil temps to germinate. We're starting them in a cooler time of the year. So we have to mimic warmer soil temps. And to do that, we need a heat mat. Now, in the fall, when we're doing fall seed starting for cool weather crops, things like broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, greens, rutabagas, beets, all that stuff, we don't use heat mats because it's plenty warm outside. We're at the end of summer, early fall, when we're doing that seed starting. And those particular crops don't need as warm soil temps usually to germinate as some of these warm season crops. So we usually just use heat mats this time of year in the spring or late winter seed starting season. We don't really find them that useful in the fall because things are already warm enough. So even in this greenhouse here with the doors rolled all the way down with it kind of tightened up as much as we can get it, we still need heat mats in here to get the soil as warm as we need it to get some of these things like peppers and eggplant and tomatoes to germinate. And by the time this video airs, I should have a blog on our website at lazydogfarm.com that lists kind of the temperature germination ranges and the optimal germination temperature for a wide variety of crops that we grow in the vegetable garden. So you can go check that out and kind of see what temperature you're aiming for as far as getting optimal germination on your seeds. So we have to use heat mats in this greenhouse this time of year to get the soil temps in our trays warm enough for some of these things to germinate. But what about if you're growing indoors? What if your seed starting room is inside your house? Well, unless you're like my grandparents who keep their house quite toasty, you're probably gonna need a heat mat there too. So if you go read that blog on our website, you'll see that the optimal seed germination temperature can vary a little bit from crop to crop. But for most of these things that we're starting right now that we're gonna be putting in the ground in spring, you're wanting to achieve a soil temp somewhere around 85 degrees. That's kind of a good rule of thumb. If you can get the soil in your tray to 85 degrees, you should get pretty good germination. Now, you're probably not keeping the thermostat inside your home on 85 degrees, although I swear my grandparents keep theirs pretty close to 80 degrees. So unless you're keeping your house really, really toasty, you're still gonna need a heat mat to get those soil temps in the trays, cups, whatever you're using up closer to 85 degrees. Now there's lots of different options on the market out there as far as heat mats go. You can buy some pretty inexpensive ones. You can spend $200 per mat on some really, really nice commercial grade ones. 
choose whatever you like whatever works in your budget but if you've got room in your budget try not to skimp on your heat mats if you get some good ones they'll last you a long long time and it'll be worth it so if you've got the resources to invest in some good heat mats do that if you're just a novice at seed starting and just want to try it out you may want to get one of the inexpensive ones they probably won't last you a long time but it'll at least get you going seed starting and let you know what you might need in the future so these are the mats we're using in our greenhouse these sun pad pro mats these are really high quality mats i can't remember the width on them i think they're close to two foot wide they're five foot long and with these you have a master mat which is the one that's plugged in here and then we can daisy chain a bunch of other mats to it i can't remember how many you can daisy chain to it but we have two more mats hooked up to this one and so these other mats don't have to be plugged into an outlet they just plug into the next mat there and everything stays nice and heated so we've got all our fig trees that were propagating on mats all the way along that side of the greenhouse there now when you get a mat you also need to have a thermostat with it so this is the thermostat that goes with this particular mat different brands of mats will have their own thermostat so make sure you get one that does have a thermostat with it because the thermostat is going to let you know what the soil temp is so the way this setup works the thermostat is plugged into the receptacle there this master or first heat mat is plugged into the thermostat You've got a little cord going from the thermostat with a sensor on it we stick that down into the soil because these fig tree pots are pretty deep I've got it stuck down in there pretty good so I can get the temperature close to where the rooting may happen there so that's going to tell us how warm our soil is and that's what's important here we want to know the soil temp we're not necessarily concerned about the air temp we're concerned about the soil temp so if I click the set button here and hold it down I've got these mats set on 105 degrees but that soil in those pots there is not going to get that warm because the air in this greenhouse is kind of cool we've been having some cool nights but if I set it at 105 I can get the soil temp right now it says 68 degrees but I've got it as high as 80 degrees just depends on what the outside temperature is so you have to play with a little bit to get it just right but um once you kind of figure it out what to set everything on you can keep that temperature pretty steady and earlier this week i bought this little 20 dollars portable electric heater to put in here just to kind of keep things from getting too cold in here at night it's not running right now because you wouldn't be able to hear me very well if it was but uh it's been keeping things pretty warm i come in here once it gets warmer in the day and turn it off but that's been working pretty well for us now if you're growing indoors your seed starting room is inside your house it's going to be a lot easier to keep those soil temps in your trays or cups constant in this greenhouse here especially with us having these cooler nights lately it's been a bit of a, a battle i have to come out here and play with it make sure things don't get too hot make sure things don't get too cool this particular greenhouse is not sealed off completely because it's got the roll-up doors if you've got a greenhouse made with glass or whatever that is sealed off it's a little easier this one is designed to not get too hot in the summer months or the early spring months which happens a lot down here but in the winter time i have to kind of play with a little bit to make sure i keep my soil temp right so you might not need a heat mat for every single seed you start every type of vegetable transplant you try to grow but if you're growing tomatoes and peppers things like that which most people are you're probably going to need a heat mat whether you're in a greenhouse whether you're doing it indoors inside your house in your garage a heat mat is going to really help you keep those soil temperatures stabilized and also get them up to that 85 degrees that we're looking for so we talked about containers we talked about soil we talked about heat now let's talk about light now the previous three topics as far as this sea starting discussion goes would apply to greenhouse and in your house or indoor growing when we start talking about lights 
we're only talking about if you're growing indoors inside your home we don't need lights in this greenhouse here we don't have to use any grow lights the light gets dispersed really well inside of here we don't have to worry about supplementing with any kind of light but if you're growing indoors you're going to need a light setup so in the last video we talked a little bit about domes and i wish i had one here that goes with this tray to show you but if you're growing indoors you probably do want to use the humidity domes just to help out with your germination so the way it works is once you've planted your seeds in these cells here you put the dome on the tray there it creates a moist humid environment you've got the tray sitting on a heat mat hopefully the dome helps create that moist humid environment to really speed up the seed germination and increase your germination rate once those seeds germinate you're going to take the dome off the tray and that's when you need to add the lights now just like with the heat mats there's a lot of options out there as far as lighting setups for seed starting you can spend a little bit or you can spend a lot you kind of get what you pay for so just keep that in mind when you're figuring out what setup works best for you it's going to have a lot to do with how many trays you're starting how big your seed starting area is but the main thing you want is the ability to raise and lower the lights you want to keep those lights right on top of these plants not touching the plants but right on top of them if the lights are too far above the plants the plants will start to reach for that light if you just grow these in your kitchen with a fluorescent ceiling light they're going to get what we call leggy really quick because they're reaching for that light up there so you want to keep the lights just close enough to these plants where they're not burning the plants but as close as you can get them on top of these plants here just a few inches above them that's going to keep the plants from reaching toward those lights and getting leggy which can be a problem if you got leggy or spindly transplants keep your lights close that's why you need the ability to raise and lower them now you can buy some light setups that have little pulleys on them so you can lower and raise them really easily those tend to be a little more expensive i've also seen folks just get a standard shop light from home depot or lowe's or wherever and put books on the end of the tray uh, jason at coghill farm does it this way just use books on the side of the tray to kind of raise and lower the light so you can add more books to get the lights higher and higher as the plants grow as far as the type of lights you need you really want to get an led light and you want it to be white you don't want a yellow light so a white led light is what you're looking for you can find some of those pretty cheap you can find them also really expensive just find a white led light and make sure your system is set up so you can lower it and raise it easily depending on the height of those plants okay so we've covered containers soil heat light now let's talk about fertilization now some seed starting mixes will have some fertility in them if it's a good seed starting mix it's sterile that's the great thing about seed starting mixes we don't want any bad stuff in there we don't want any weed seeds in there we don't want any harmful bacteria or fungi now some seed starting mixes will contain some kind of organic slow release nutrients that can help feed your seedlings i have found from my personal experience i still have to supplement my seedlings it may have something to do with the fact that i'm watering from the top and i'm losing some of that as the water drips out the bottom i have to fertilize mine you can play around with it see if you really need to or not see if they look green and healthy uh, if they don't you might want to give them a shot i'm going to show you how i know when to start fertilizing my transplants and how i do it so we've got several trays of lettuce here this particular tray that's mostly germinated we planted several weeks ago and this tray or these two trays here the lettuce is just starting to come up as you can see right there so each little seedling only has two leaves these here have four leaves each so that second set of leaves there that we see that looks more like what the big leaf is going to look like is what we call a true leaf so we want to start fertilizing or we can start fertilizing as soon as we see those true leaves there or that second set of leaves 
Now there's several different devices or tools you can use to fertilize seedlings. They make these little siphons that you can inject it through your water supply. Those work pretty good. For what I'm doing, I found that just a little handheld spraying system works good enough. If you're indoors, you might just choose to use a little spray bottle like this. I really like this thing right here, this little one liter pump sprayer. I got this at the dollar store up the road last year. It was on clearance. They were clearing out all their garden and stuff in the fall and I got this for five bucks and it's been one of the best five bucks I've ever spent. So I like this rig right here. You can use a spray bottle. There's lots of different things you can use to fertilize your seedlings. As far as the fertilizer itself that you can use, got a couple different options here you mainly want to pick something that has a balanced nutrient analysis so this N P and K analysis here you want to make sure those numbers are pretty much the same so this is a organic fertilizer here with fish emulsion and corn steep liquor we've got a code if you want to grab some of this use lazy dog farm on agrothrive's website you can get 10 percent off so this is an organic formulation and then we have our 20 20 20 right here that we can use as well you got to be a lot more careful with this than you do this you can burn and kill seedlings with this this you're pretty safe with this is going to work a little faster than this but you just have to be careful with this and as far as how much i'm putting in this little one liter sprayer here with the 20 20 20 i think that is a quarter cup measuring cup there i'm pretty sure it is so i'll just put one little scoop of that in here fill it up with water and then spray the plants with it for the agrothrive you don't have to be as exact with the measurements usually a cup of that it's in a liquid formulation so a cup maybe a little bit more in here fill it up with water and spray the plants and once they're up and growing, once they've got those true leaves like I showed you earlier, we generally try to feed the seedlings at least once a week. If they're looking kind of pitiful or maybe you're getting really close to planting time, you can do what we call push them. Start feeding them twice a week. They'll grow out faster. You can get them in the ground faster. If you're seeing that the weather is still kind of cool and you think it's going to be a little while before you're able to get these things in the ground, you can do the reverse of that and slow them down a little bit. Maybe only fertilize them once every two weeks. Slow them down a little bit so they don't get root bound. You don't have to step them up and they'll still be good to transplant when your weather is ready. So I think that covers all the general things as far as basic seed starting goes. And if I miss something, definitely put that in the comments below. We'll try to add it on to another video in the future. But all that information there, you take all that, apply it to your situation, the space you have, the number of plants you're going to need to grow, and kind of follow it along. I think you'll be pretty successful. Seed starting is one of those things where you can't really skimp a lot on the process. It's kind of like baking. You got to be pretty exact with it. You can't be getting all willy-nilly throwing stuff in there here and there. You got to be pretty exact with it. You got to be pretty precise with it. But once you get it down pat, it's pretty easy. So let's take all that information that we just put together and get our first tray of seeds started for the warm season of 2022. We're going to be starting one tray today. We're going to be putting a lot of different peppers and tomatoes in there. I'm going to go ahead and start some of my heirloom tomatoes. Because our tomato growing season down here is pretty short, for these heirloom varieties that will tend to bite the dust as soon as things get real hot, and we don't know when that's going to happen. It could be late spring, it could be early summer, but they'll bite the dust when things get really hot and humid. So we want to give those a little bit of a head start, maybe put a little bigger transplant in the ground. So we'll get those started today along with some peppers, which can take a while to germinate. So you want to give yourself plenty of time with those too. So we're going to start off here with one of these PropTech 162 cell trays. Almost all the things I'll be putting in here today, the heirloom tomatoes and the peppers, will be things that I step up to a slightly larger pot just because I want to go in the ground with a little bigger transplant. So we're going to start a bunch of different things in here. I'll start them in here instead of the bigger pots because we may get some variable germination here. Everything might not come up, so we save seed starting mix that way i have it 
I have all my pro mix here in this tub so we'll just start filling up this tray right here as I told you in that last video some people like to wet it in a tub and then pack it into the tray I like working with this stuff better when it's dry but if you're indoors it's probably easier for you to wet it and then pack it in the tray so it just depends on your situation I like working with it when it's dry and then we'll wet it down here in a minute so we'll just kind of smooth that out make sure we get all those trays filled there and if you want to be real careful about not wasting any seed started mix you can do this in a wheelbarrow or a tub or something so none of it kind of falls onto the ground now I don't pack the seed starting mix down into the cell some people will tell you to do that I just want to kind of smooth it out here I don't want so much seed starting mix so that I can't see the divisions between the cells I want to be able to tell where to put each of my seeds so I want to smooth it out get all the cells filled pick up any little sticks I see and we'll let the water kind of pack it and compress it in there so now that we've got our seed starting mix in here this is where we want to kind of wet it down real good so you want to be a little careful with this you don't want too much pressure So we'll wet it down a little bit, let that water kind of seep through those cells, wait a second or two, and do it again. Wait another few seconds, and then one more time should be good. okay so that should be plenty moist there feels like it is and we see water dropping from the bottom of all of those cells we know that the entire cell from top to bottom should be sufficiently moist in there so now i've moved over to the other side of the greenhouse got this tray on a heat mat so the soil can go ahead and start warming up some so the first thing i want to do is make some little indentions here or dibbles for my seed the general rule is that you want the indention, dibble, hole, whatever you want to call it, to be twice the diameter of the seed you're planting. So for tomato and pepper seeds, which aren't that big, we don't need that big of an indention. So I just press down lightly here, my fingers, just make a little indention in the center of each cell, and that's where we'll be putting our seeds. And then I'm going to go ahead and put my labels in here. I've already written on these, kind of my system for doing this. I write the crop on one side, so pepper, and then I write the variety name on the other side. That way nothing gets confused. Hopefully it doesn't. I got these from Johnny's. I went ahead and bought a big box of them. I like these smaller ones. I've used bigger ones in the past, but when I'm throwing around these seed trays in the garden planting, those big ones will break off on me so i like these smaller ones you can use popsicle sticks whatever you have but uh these little wooden labels i like these because if i do drop them somewhere they biodegrade unlike plastic which i'll have to pick up at some point so i've got my sticks in here my labels and for most of these we're just going to plant one row or one lane in this seed starting tray and for tomatoes i would rather plant pelleted tomato seed but Usually you can only get pelleted seed for the hybrids, the determinants. Can't really get them for these indeterminate varieties. These rare giant crimson seeds only came five to the pack here. So we ain't got a whole lot of these. Hopefully just a few of them, or at least a few of them germinate so we can give it a good shot. I may double plant a few of these cells here just to be sure. I don't know if you can hear that, but it's starting to rain outside. We're fine in here, but hopefully it doesn't make it where you can't hear me too well. So we've got all our tomatoes there. Now time for our peppers here, which are a little easier to plant than tomatoes because they're a little bigger. We'll do one seed per cell on these. Should get pretty good germination off some of these hybrid peppers from Johnny's. Usually from my experiences, the hybrid seeds tend to germinate a little better than the 
open pollinated seeds. So sometimes on the open pollinated heirloom stuff, I'll do two seeds per cell. Use it on these high performance hybrids. One seed per cell is plenty. And then the last thing we'll do here is we'll cover our seeds. Now you can cover them with more seed starting mix. Just make sure it's really fine and broken up. Some people cover them with vermiculite. I like to use perlite. This is a trick we learned from a lot of the commercial growers around here. And it works pretty well to keep everything not too wet at the soil surface there. Kind of makes it a little easier for the seeds to emerge. Sometimes the seed starting mix for things like peppers that take a while to germinate, sometimes the seed start mix will kind of crust over just a little bit. So this perlite makes it easier for the seeds to kind of bust through there when they're ready to do so. so. We don't want to put a whole lot on there, just enough to cover those seeds. We still want to be able to see the divisions between our cells there in case we do need to come back and thin some stuff out later. And this isn't completely necessary. Like I said, this is just something we like to do. You can try it, see if you like it or not. Most people just use more seed starting mix. And then we just need to water these in a little bit, lightly and carefully. So we've got them on the heat mat there, which is what we want. Now I'm gonna take my thermostat probe from these fig pots and I'm gonna stick it right in the corner of this tray right here so I can really know the temperature of this particular tray everything else should match it but I really want to focus on this get some good germination here I really want to try to get that temp as close to 85 as we can things will still germinate probably in the high 70s and 80s we want to try to get it close to 85 one thing I'm going to do is go ahead and turn on my heater here and let that puppy start getting things nice and warm in here. So hopefully you can still hear me with the heater on and the rain going on outside. But that's it. That's our simple seed starting process. Yes, if you're going to start growing your own transplants, doing your own seed starting, you're going to have to invest in a few things up front, probably some trays, some kind of container, a heat mat, maybe even a lighting setup if you're growing indoors. But once you have that stuff, it's gonna last you a while and the amount of transplants you're gonna be able to grow year after year, those things that you have to buy initially are gonna pay for themselves pretty quickly. So I hope you enjoyed this little seed starting basic series. And if you've got anything to add to what I said, put that in the comments below. If you disagree with anything I said, put that in the comments below too so we can all learn from one another. Don't forget to go to our website, lazydogfarm.com, where you can see that blog where we've listed all the optimal germination temperatures for all the different kind of vegetables we like to grow. If you did enjoy this video, make sure to subscribe, hit that notification button, like, and share, and we'll see you next time right here at Lazy Dog Farm. Oh, well. By the beauty of your life